Hi guys, uh, I'm here to talk a little bit about the questions that I have made for you. So the first question was what is a uh, metabolic flux? So very in a very simplified way we can answer like that flux flux metabolic flux is flux of metabolites through metabolic pathways. So just the opposite of the question, right? But let's but it's very complicated to understand, so let's discuss a little bit. So you probably have uh, read something about metabolic flux analysis, right? Uh, what is this? This measure the flux of metabolite through metabolic pathways. How we do that? We usually take uh, these labeled carbons with uh, carbon uh, 13. Uh, in this case, uh, in this example here, they are measuring the flux of CO2, okay? Uh, the CO2, it's labeled with the 13C instead of the, instead of the 12C. Uh, and this uh, CO2 of this carbon is going to be included in the metabolism of plants by the fixation of rubisco. You remember that it's the main enzyme that fix CO2 in the calvin benson cycle. And then uh, by mass spectrometry or nuclear magnetic resonance, we, we can look in the other metabolites that contains this carbon here. Okay, so for example, this carbon here, it's a cycle, a black cycle, and it was included here by Rubisco, and it, it ended up here in alanine, pyruvate, valine, and so on. So here, it's one example of how we are measuring the photosynthetic fluxes because we are measuring the fluxes from the 13 CO2. Okay, we can use not we cannot only measure the carbon flux, but also but also the nitrogen flux. For example, if you have nitrogen labeled, we can measure the fluxes of uh, nitrogen. For example, okay, so the flux that we are measuring here depends on what you are using as labeled. Okay, why we use 13C? Because in the atmosphere we have 12C and 13C, but almost 90-90% of the CO2 that we breathe or that we have in the atmosphere is 12. Okay, so the 13C it's very uh, it's it's 1.1 percent actually okay so when we put the plant or the organism to use 13 C instead of 12 it means that we are going to increase the amount of 13 C in the metabolites okay and then by mass spectrometry we can search for this metabolite that has been increased in the metabolism okay so for, for example in this case we are measuring the flux of co2 right uh, so co2 it contains one carbon so this carbon in red here it's incorporated in 3 pga and then uh, after a certain time you have this uh, pga's uh, metabolites here labeled with one carbon but remember that this is part of the calvin benson cycle. So this carbon comes here and then gets another carbon and so on and so on. So it's a cycle, right? And uh, what happens is that over time you have uh, the increase of this carbon labeled here. Okay, you have increase of the incorporation of this carbon here. And then at the end you have uh, in this case, we have all the three PGA, PD, PGA uh, that contains only this labeled carbon. Okay, so to measure fluxes, uh, we must consider, there are some exceptions, but in most cases, we, we must uh, consider measure this on time, because it depends on time. Okay, so because the time you determine how much uh, label has been incorporated. Another example, for example, here you have the, the glutamate that we are going to see in the next class about um, 
this TCA cycle in the glutamate is going to be this, the, the next two class about respiration and also amino acid amino acid synthesis. So glutamate has five carbons, okay? One, two, three, four, five. And look to the color. So the red, black, and blue. The red one is this carbon here which is fixed in the case of plants and also bacteria and also many other organisms are fixed by one uh, carbon, uh, one enzyme named PEPC, phosphenol pyruvate carboxylase. So this enzyme takes phosphenol pyruvate, incorporates a bicarbonate in the car and, then trans and then produce this metabolite here, oxalacetate. And the oxalacetate, you enter the TCA cycle here and then it's going to glutamate synthesis. So one carbon here comes from this reaction. The blue carbons here comes from the glycolysis. Remember that here is triose phosphate, phosphonyl pyruvate, pyruvate. The glycolysis end up here, right? From, from here to the TCA, we are, we are going to see that is uh, respiration. It's, a, it, it's the second phase of respiration. So pyruvate is decarboxylated by the pyruvate dehydrogenase. We are going to study also the enzyme. And two carbons enter here and together with oxalacetate, the acetyl-CoA produce citrate, which contains six carbons. One carbon is lost here and then you have these two carbons here in blue at the end are incorporated in glutamate. Okay. And where these other carbons come from? From the TCA cycle. So the TCA cycle is running here, or the citrate is coming from the other side and contains these two carbons here that is being incorporated. Okay? So how can we measure fluxes then? If I want to measure the flux of this carbon here, I include this carbon, label it, to the uh, organism fix. Uh, and then I'm going to follow this carbon through all the metabolites. Okay, so this is one way to measure uh, the fluxes. So the uh, metabolic flux analysis has uh, one advantage that is try that it re reflects the enzyme activity in vivo. So if you have third la malate labeled with 13C, malate has four carbons. If all the carbons has been labeled, you can buy a compound like that. And if you measure the incorporation of this 13C coming from malate into oxalacetate, you are measuring the activity of malate dehydrogenase in vivo, right? Uh, so if you have a substrate and you have a product of one reaction, you can measure the, the activity that is in the middle. Okay, metabolic flux analysis can do that. So this practically answered the, que the second question, how can we measure glycolytic fluxes? So glycolytic flux, we are talking about glycolysis that starts with glucose. So then you have to use glucose label it and for example, measure the incorporation in pyruvate. You can measure in any intermediate. By pyruvate, you know, you remember that it's the end of the glycolysis, right? So if I measure this over time, I'm gonna have how the glycolytic fluxes are increasing or decreasing over time. Perfect. Uh, glucose here, the label of this carbon here has been incorporated in pyruvate over time and then you have the glycolytic fluxes. Okay, am I clear here? Um, the second question was, what is a futile cycle? We can also say su substrate cycle, okay? Uh, but I think futile cycle, it's more, how to say, I think it's better to understand what is this cycle. So futile cycles, by definition, are metabolic reactions in which the net energy balance or the carbon flux around it is zero or near to it. Imagine something in the steady state, okay? So um, something that has been produced and has been consumed at the same rate. For example, you have glucose that has been can be transformed to glucose 6-phosphate 
in glucose, six oxalate can also be transformed in glucose. Here you have the consumption of ATP, but the production of ADP. So you lose one phosphate here, but here one phosphate is produced. So uh, the net energy here we are talking about ATP balance. So the balance here is zero. Okay. Uh, the same goes for fructose uh, six phosphate to fructose six bisphosphate, and here you have more reactions. So you have oxaloacetate, you have phosphonylpyruvate, and then you have pyruvate. So futile cycles are not only simple like that; can be much higher than two, than three metabolites. Okay. So for example, uh, this is a supposed uh, sucrose futil cycle that uh, is supposed to happen in plants. So remember that sucrose can be degraded by invertase and sucrose intase into the exose, and then you have the exose phosphate, right? Here you have the exokinase that use ATP to phosphorylate both glucose and fructose, but here you have another enzyme that can uh, use UDP glucose to produce sucrose 6-phosphate that can then be used to produce uh, sucrose. Okay, so sometimes it happens that the, the, the sugar, instead of being uh, converted by invertase into glucose and fructose, is converted into fructose and uh, UDP glucose, and then you have this kind of, in red here, the fructose cycle produced. So you have sucrose being degraded, and then you have sucrose being uh, being produced. So what is the importance of this cycle? Uh, the, one one of the uh, possible explanations that we have uh, this is just to let you know that fertil cycle is not really well uh, studied. So um, we have some hypothesis on why these cycles happen. So remember that sucrose 6-phosphate can also be converted into glucose 1-phosphate and this also can be converted into glucose 1-phosphate and then go to uh, storage carbon uh, compounds, for example starch. But starch is very complicated because it's a huge metabolite, it's a huge compound and also needs a lot of reaction until uh, the carbon comes from here to starch. So many reactions have to happen to, to the starch being synthesized. So one possible advantage of creating of this futile cycle is that the carbon is gonna be here in the cytosol and when this carbon is needed to activate uh, glycolysis, you don't need to have starch degradation, for example, which involves also a lot of uh, enzymes. So the carbon will be here ready to go. Okay, so this is one possible uh, explanation. So some reactions uh, involved in these futile cycles can also produce uh, energy, can also produce um, heat, for example. So producing heat is important for some animals. So it's, uh, it's another possible explanation. So every futile cycle you have its own explanation, but one that is uh, quite common is that Instead of the carbon going to the storage compound, which is glycogen, uh, starch, and so on, uh, keeping it this carbon in the fertile cycle is one way to uh, have it released faster when it's needed. Okay, in this case, the the, the sugars is going to be released when glycolysis has to be activated. Okay, so uh, I hope you. Uh, I have qualified some points. If you, uh, if you have any other question, just let me know. Thank you.